How many forms are there of depression? Well, you know, the best way to understand what we've been hearing is, is yeah. to look at it as a spectrum. On the one end of the spectrum, you mentioned of normal depression. We right. all have bad days right. or right. bad runs of days. Then you have grief reactions. Now, grief reactions cross-sectionally can look like, a, like what you described. Mm. But the difference is after a couple of weeks, people begin to reconnect and, and they don't get over it. You never have that empty spot filled, but you're not depressed anymore. It's That's, interesting. Kate makes the point that one of the differences between grief reactions and depression is with depression, it's endless. Mm. Yeah. No matter what happens, you don't feel bad. With, with, right. with grief reaction, friends come to visit you, you can yeah. transiently feel yeah, You better. can reach out. And as you said, week after week, I mean, the biggest distinction between one end of the spectrum and the other is duration, week after week versus transient. Uh, the, degree of, the degree of symptoms, I mean, if it's just about your mood and your thinking, mm. that's one thing. If it's about your body, total body illness, sleep, appetite, everything you're mentioning, then it's, it's, it's at the other end of the spectrum. The pharmacological treatments are absolutely required in the more severe end of the spectrum. Uh, they also work in the middle of the spectrum, but so does psychotherapy work. Sometimes the combination uh, works better than anything else. You mentioned suicide. Uh, depressed patients, when they recover, you know, go about putting their life back together. They go about uh, putting their family right. relationship, and a lot of damage that occurs, and mo most depressed patients can Get, you know, get maybe 80% of what they had going for them back. Uh, but the one irreversible tragic outcome is, is of course, suicide. And 80% of all suicides are explained by clinical depression. And uh, the suicide rate is a very interesting paradox that the women get depression twice as often as men. But men kill themselves three times or four times more often than women. So if you put those two together, it's like an eightfold difference in terms of how you know men with depression are that much more likely to kill themselves than women. And the reason for that is that the most successful methods of suicide are the aggressive violent ones. Guns, jumping off bridges, throwing yourself in front of a subway. And they, they are the ones that succeed. And so what, what suicide is is a, a intersection of depression and aggression. And that's of course the ultimate point about, uh, about getting effective treatment. Um, what role does genetic play? Genetics uh, is the most important predisposing factor, particularly for the recurrent illnesses. Bipolar is estimated to be about 80% of the variance is, is predictable by family history and genetics. And these are where they do identical twins reared apart, you know, which is the best way to separate nature from nurture. Next to autism, bipolar illness is the most genetic illness in psychiatry. Uh, now that doesn't mean that it's not triggered. It requires a trigger and often, uh, once it's triggered, like the first episode in bipolar illness might occur when you're 17 or 18, once it's triggered, the brain has changed. And you follow that patient over several episodes. By the third or fourth episode, it doesn't seem to need much of a trigger anymore at all. It, it seems to have taken on a life of its own. And then there's re highly recurrent unipolar. Right. Uh, they don't have mania, but they have a need for long-term treatment, mm. uh, preventive treatment. And we, we focus a lot on treating the actual depression that's in front of us, but perhaps there's much more importance in the long run about adequate ways to, to prevent something. And there's you know, discussion now about could you detect this stuff really early and perhaps treat a child before they even had their first episode. That's one of the yeah, emerging the areas of research. The same discussion is yeah, going on. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, talk about the neurobiology of depression for us. Well, it's gone through several phases. One of the, it started actually with the discoveries that um, Eric spoke about earlier. And so suddenly we had drugs that could actually perturb the central nervous system, could make the individual feel better, not instantaneously, like cocaine and amphetamines, but over time they would feel better. And uh, this became one of the things that was identified as the pharmacologic bridge. It was thought that this was taking us from a behavior to an understanding of brain. And in, I was at that time working in, in England at the Medical Research Council, and we were very interested in serotonin, which you can see here. But uh, in America, folks were very interested in norepinephrine, which is one of the other long tracks. These, these are very interesting parts of the brain communication system. They're the sort of super highways. They start in the ancient brain, down in the brain stem, and they arborize like a tree over the whole of the frontal lobe and the cortex, which is the very human part of us, of course. So we began to realize that the 
pathways were working together and most of the early drugs actually influenced all of these pathways. And later it was realized that this was a focus of modulation which was organized around the synapse. And that was very exciting because suddenly, you know, psychiatry who'd been out there <laughs> talking for years and lying on couches and things suddenly had, they could join the physicians right, again. Right, right. So the early drugs were not extraordinary because they had lots of side effects. So people had a dry mouth and they, they, they didn't feel well, but sexual they felt better, sexual dysfunctions and so on. Then along came refinements because the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry um, obviously recognized this as a potential market. They began to refine these drugs in the, what were called the SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which were very focused upon the serotonin system, came out in the late 80s, early 90s. And that was a, a, great, a great boost because the side effects were far better. Mm. But what we increasingly recognized, I think, and technology was advancing along the way. We were beginning to be able to image the brain and so we were able to see the anguish going on inside somebody's head in terms of blood flow, mm -hmm. which areas were active. We know that the anatomy, because that was also uh, progressing, is different for these parts, that the frontal lobes control some of the limbic structures. This anatomy had all been advancing during the same time. When I was in medical school we had no idea what the frontal lobes did basically. So if you put that together it was a systems problem, and that was one of the great advances which I think uh, then brought even neurologists in to talk to us about depression. Yeah. Uh, Helen, depression, biological basis uh, in a neural circuit, and neural circuits. Well, I think what everyone's been talking about up to now is the idea this is in the brain, and for neurology, the question is where in the brain, and real estate counts. You have to actually know which part of the brain does what. It isn't a big bowl of soup, add the serotonin and stir, which was really the concept that moving from psychotherapy to pharmacology embraced. Moving into the brain was the first step. But the issue is how to dissect the symptoms, the syndrome, into the component parts. Because while it's a involvement of many parts of the brain, it's involvement of specific parts of the brain. And the way we approached that was we couldn't do it as we usually did in neurology by dissecting the brain after someone died like you would after they'd had a stroke and say they couldn't move their arm or they had a language disturbance. There weren't large lesions in the brain with people with depression. So instead we were able to take advantage of functional imaging methods that I know you've talked about on right. other episodes. Could actually literally say when you're depressed what areas of the brain aren't working properly. Take a very simple-minded point of view. This is really a war. I mean it's really remarkable you know Freud, Wernicke, Alzheimer's, everyone knew these were brain disorders. Yes. They were all cutting brains way back. They just couldn't find anything. They needed other theories to actually accommodate right. what they knew to be true. And this is the remarkable issue about the time we live in. We now have tools that allow us to test what we know to be true. Freud knew that Freud. all of the things he was dealing with had a biological basis. And he tried to develop a model to explain right. them. And it was trivial. He didn't publish it in his lifetime. But he realized someday biology would come along and give you an insight into it. So what people discovered was that it wasn't just one area of the brain. Just like the syndrome has problems with different symptoms, that there were multiple areas of the brains that weren't functioning normally. Some areas were overactive, some areas were underactive, different combinations in different patients. But there started to be a pattern. And there started to be the nodes in what would become a putative network that was involved in major depression. What are the big areas? The ringleader, as the data has evolved over time, is this area 25. It's the subcolossal cingulate. It's an area deep in the frontal lobe. And it seems to always show itself whenever there's an intense negative experience. Area 25 is the negative mood regulator, but it's also associated with areas like the amygdala, the prime hub for mediating all stress responses, all novel all emotional responses. M emotional responses, actually anything novel gets processed originally through the amygdala and the amygdala in area 25 have an intimate relationship with one another. Other areas that are important regulate drives like the 
hypothalamus. This is the core. Many nuclei are involved in sleep, appetite, libido. Again, a direct link between area 25 and the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus and the amygdala. The hippocampus, where memory context is there. And when one thinks about what happens when a event happens in your environment, it's immediately processed by the amygdala. Area 25 and the amygdala have a discussion about it. The hippocampus on, comes online to kind of say, is this familiar? Have I been there before to provide context? And a whole cascade of events will go on to respond to those stimuli. Not thought about by your prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that really at the end of the day will have to synthesize all the information and decide what you're going to do about it. And it is this crosstalk between these various areas, this choreography, if you will, which is how emotion and thinking help us to plan our day and respond to the world around us in a functional and um, healthy way. What's the velocity of understanding about depression? Are we in a plateau? Are we learning new things every day? Oh, well, no, it's, I think we're moving. Has the I imaging think, taken us to places that we, we've well, never been before? What I, we've learned from imaging, it's provided a template to think about all these things. You can test to see what areas of the brain change when someone takes a medication, right. what part of the circuit changes. What's the difference between getting better when you take the medicine versus not. You can see how the system is responsive to the treatment. You can compare drug and psychotherapy and realize they have certain areas of the brain they affect commonly. They have other areas that are complementary that help us to understand why each one may get certain people better, but in combination, people do better than either alone. We equally have now moved to the point to realize that there are some people not like um, Andrew's example, that actually can get well only with psychotherapy and don't require drug, but other people who actually do require drug and can benefit also from psychotherapy. And we can actually are now learning that at the level of the brain with the brain scans in this circuit, that actually there are biomarkers that say, if you don't get psychotherapy, you will not get better on drug. Mm. And alternatively, you may want psychotherapy, but if you don't get drug, you are not going to get well. So we're actually learning that by having this circuit model, having the data, having access and have involvement of patients that are systematically studied, we can actually parse the circuit, understand the patterns, and understand adaptation of how to facilitate the brain getting back to an equilibrium state. And that kind of work has only been um, enabled by these advanced technologies. Right. To go back to your velocity question, yes. mm -hmm. all the science we're talking about is a wonderful velocity. But translating that into the real world of helping patients, right. that's Slowly. the best of times, worst of times. Ah, the worst, of, worst ti of times. The worst of times is that the pharmaceutical industry is moving out of the brain area. It's getting incredibly expensive. There's un, not some, I think, excessive demonization of the industry. They're not working. They don't want to work with academia anymore because academics get stigmatized for it. And so you have this incredible proliferation of fantastic science. But looking down the road, all the leaders of the field are saying, wait a minute, how are we going to get these fantastic discoveries translated into things that can go for patients? The reason and, they and have that, not moved, and I think it's part of the pharmaceutical industry, is that they have not moved, as we have in this roundtable discussion, from the synapse to the system. Right, but the point is they're finding it economically unfeasible to do it that, because the trials have gotten so long now. True. The FDA, it's now over a billion very dollars. Which standards, makes it very yeah. hard to yeah. bring it. And, and, and particularly if you want to get a, uh, a focus, like you're saying, you know, there might be a biomarker 